last week as we we're speaking about this parable of the vine and branches where Jesus is talking about having a personal relationship with him and what that looks like. Last week we pointed out that there are two key words in this parable. Um, the first one is the word abide and the second one is the word fruit. Those are the two words that appear the most in this parable and they are ones that we need to understand in order to understand the parable. Today, I, we will seek to define those words. Uh, so um, pay attention as we go through. And there may be a little bit of an explanation before we get to the definition, so be patient. Uh, but um, by the grace of God, we will define those so that we can then uh, take that definition to this parable and understand what what Jesus is teaching here. So as we understand these words, and as we understand how they are used, it should make the meaning of this parable clear and open up to us what he's saying. Now we're not going to finish the parable today, uh, but we will get that uh, basic foundation of uh, how to define the terms and then how to, how to interpret it as it goes forward. So we're looking at abiding in Christ means I bear fruit. And that actually covers the first four verses. We looked last week at uh, verse 1 that speaks of the vine being Jesus and the vine dresser being God the Father. We looked at two types of branches. The first type of branch was a branch that does not bear fruit, which is common on a vine. And that type of branch is cut off because it does not bear fruit. Uh, we likened that to Judas. Judas was a branch cut off because he did not bear fruit. He was, he was just absorbing what Jesus uh, had to offer uh, for himself, for his own fleshly and selfish desires. Uh, he was a thief. He kept the money bag, and he took out of the, the money bag what he wanted. Uh, he pilfered from it as a thief. Uh, he was not in it to, uh, for, for Christ because of a relationship we had with Christ. The second type of branch is a branch that bears fruit, and in this parable specifically, that's referring to the other 11 disciples, uh, the, the 11 that are left. The two, uh, Judas one has left, he's not with them at this time as Jesus speaks this parable, and so uh, this parable is where it speaks about the branches that bear fruit, he's talking about the 11 disciples. He's also talking about all of us, like the 11 disciples, who have placed our faith in Christ and have a personal relationship with him. So let's look at uh, verses 3 and 4, and I've entitled this Fruitful Branches. Fruitful Branches. He says, You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Again, he's speaking to the 11 disciples, the ones who are left. You are already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. His message to them in this verse is not as clear in the English version as it is in the, the Greek version. And the reason for that is because the word translated pr uh, prunes, where the father prunes the, the branches that, um, uh, that they'll bear more fruit, and the word clean in verse 3 are from the same root word. They're actually the same word, just a different version. For instance, the word in, um, that's translated prude in verse 2 is the verb form. And in verse 3, it's the adjective form. So what he's actually saying here is that pruning is also cleansing. It means the same thing. And uh, when pruning is done on a vine, a grapevine today, uh, it's, it's sometimes called cleansing, as it was in the day of our Lord. Now, the NIV does bring this out. Um, the NIV says this, every branch that does bear fruit, he trims clean. So it gives that sense of what this word is referring to. It's referring to pruning, but it's also referring to cleansing so that it may bear even more fruit. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. 
and a uh, quote we had last week from Stephen Sizer, part of that says, um, since the shoots, these are the, the uh, sucker branches that are cut off, it says, since the shoots grow right where the branch joins the stem, creating a tight cluster where dirt, leaves, and other debris collect, uh, the pruning is basically a cleansing process. So he is talking here about these branches that bear fruit, and they need pruning, but the pruning is a cleansing. And then he says to them, you are already clean because of the word. You're already pruned because of the word that I have spoken to you. So I want you to get the sense of what he's saying here. These are the branches that bear fruit. Uh, that's what he's saying. Every branch, the end of verse 2, every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit, you're already pruned. Or it could read, um, every branch that bears fruit, he cleanses, that it may bear more fruit, you're already clean. So he's saying to them, they are branches that bear fruit. The 11 are branches that bear fruit. They have already been cleansed. They have already been made clean. He's describing the eleven branches that are intimately connected with Jesus, as a branch is with the vine. That's what he's talking about. And he says, "You eleven are likened to these branches, intimately connected with me, that uh, are bearing fruit. You're in the vine, and you're bearing fruit." So, what does this mean for the eleven? Well, it means this. The 11 are saved by faith in Jesus, which led to love for Jesus and results in obedience to Jesus. Now, where do we get that? We get that from the broader context of this, of this um, parable. If you go back to chapter 14, in verse 1, notice what he is pointing them toward. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In me, Jesus. Believe also in me. What's he pointing them to? He's pointing them to faith in himself. He's saying, believe in me. Verse 6, he makes it even more specific about belief in me. He tells them that he's going to go away. And, and where I go, you know, and and the way you know, and, and Thomas says, we don't know where you're going, and we don't know the way. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. I am the way to the Father's house. I am the way to heaven. I am the truth. The truth. If you're going to be in the truth, if you're going to know the truth, if you're going to live according to the truth, you must believe in Jesus because he is the truth. Yeah. And I am the way. I am the way that you get into a right relationship with the Father and have a place reserved for you in heaven. And notice also what this leads to. Go down to verse 15 of chapter 14. If you love me, Keep my commandments. And so he connects love and obedience together. And so he says, you are you're to love me. The demonstration of that is that you keep my commandments. You obey me. In verse 21 as well. Uh, he says, uh, he who has my commandments and keeps them, obeys them, that is, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. And so here is the context. He has been speaking about faith in Christ, love for Christ, demonstrated by obedience to Christ. And he's saying to these disciples, you have been cleansed, you've been your branches in the vine you're in the vine because you have believed in me. You're in the vine and now you love me because you're intimately connected with me. My life flows through you. And you're ones who obey because the Father continues to prune you out of his love for you 
that you stay there because of your love for him and for me. So one who is saved is cleansed. They are made clean as God cuts off what has naturally grown in our lives and produces Jesus' fruit in its place. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, he says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Any of them that connect themselves in some way to Jesus will be cut off unless, verse 11, and such were some of you. That's what you were. But something has happened. A cleansing process has happened. That's what he talks about next. But you were washed from those sins. You were sanctified, set apart to God, cleansed by him. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. You are not what you used to be if you're connected to Jesus. You become a branch in the vine now, and the life of Christ is in you. The life of Christ flows through you. You are not the same. You've been washed. You've been cleansed. That's what he's talking about here, isn't it? He's talking about salvation. He's talking about faith in Christ that brings us into a relationship with Christ. Titus 3, 5, we read that this morning. Not by works of righteousness which you have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. We sang about that too, didn't we? Sang about his mercy through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Again, salvation is spo spoken of as a washing, as a cleansing. And here, in the parable, is spoken of as a pruning, a cutting off. It's a cutting off of the flesh and being put into Christ and Christ being put into you. Once we are saved, God continues this cleansing process. He continues to cut off what would naturally grow from our flesh to produce more and more of Jesus' fruit in us. The cleansing here is not perfection, but the cleansing is moving in a different direction. We're, we're, we're moving and progressing in our walk with the Lord and in our faith. In John uh, 13, uh, Jesus has, uh, and that's in the, the context of all this as well, Jesus has just... Um, come to his disciples to, to wash their feet. And um, as he begins to wash their feet, uh, Peter says, uh, uh, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus said to him, if I do not wash your feet, you have no part with me. And so Simon said, Lord, not only my feet, but my hands and my head. Typical of Peter. But Jesus says this in verse 10. He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him, therefore he said, you are not all clean. He's talking about salvation here. Salvation is a, is a bath. <laughs> it's a spiritual bath bath that cleans you, that washes your sin away, places you in Christ. It cleans you on the inside. And it cleans you on the outside in that it changes your outward behavior. But here he's speaking about washing feet because in when you walk in this world, your feet get dirty. You pick up some of the things in the world and you, you need that continual cleansing. But that cleansing is not getting saved again. That cleansing is, is to enhance the relationship with the Lord. We, we still need to be pruned. We still respond in the flesh sometimes when things happen to us. 
And so we need that continual cleansing, that continual pruning that the Father does for us. But we're already clean. We're already clean. Now also notice the means that God uses to cleanse us. The means that God uses to save us, that is, to make us clean. How does he do that? Well, he says here in the parable, going back to uh, John 15, <clears throat> you are already clean because, here are the means, because of the word which I have spoken to you. Jesus was speaking the word of God to them. And God uses his word to save us, that is, to cleanse us. In verse, uh, go back to chapter 14, verse 24. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. <clears throat> the word that Jesus spoke to them weren't simply Jesus' words. They were the Father's words. The word of God is what was spoken to them. And it was the word of God that produced the cleansing. It was the word of God that produced the salvation. In uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, Peter says, Having been born again, saved, cleansed, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God which lives and abides forever. It is the word of God that saves. It is the gospel that has the power of God, that is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. You can't save yourself. It's, you're saved through the power of the word of God. And isn't it interesting, too, that in this, this cleansing, God uses the incorruptible word of God to, to cleanse us for salvation, but he also uses it for that constant cleansing that takes place in our life as believers, where we constantly have to go to the Lord and confess sin. We don't just do it on communion Sundays. At least I hope not. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that there's plenty of sin between one communion Sunday and another. But we're convicted by the Spirit of God. You know why we're convicted by the Spirit of God? Because he's using the Word of God to show us what, how God sees it, not how we see it. God's perspective, not our perspective. Let me tie this together with something else that we have looked at. The church is a bride. Uh, Ephesians 5, 26. What did he say about the bride? That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. You see how it all connects. It's, we desperately need to know and understand the word of God. Because that is what God uses to save us, and that is what God uses to cleanse us. It is God's word, and it is to be received by faith. And that's what was lacking in Judas. Judas did not have faith. Uh, the writer of Hebrews speaks of the children of Israel, where they didn't enter the rest. They didn't enter into the promised land because of their unbelief. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it, for indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, them being the children of Israel, uh, unwilling to go into the promised land. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. The word of God will profit you nothing if it is not mixed with faith. If you don't believe it and trust it, it will profit you nothing. You must believe the word of God if there is going to be a profit from hearing the word of God. Chapter 
11, verse 6, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him, that is, to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he, he is, he is who he is, he, he is God, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You cannot please God without faith in him, and faith that he is, he is who he is and that he is a rewarder. That when he says he will save, he will save. This word of God is what saves. For I'm not ashamed, Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, but also to the Greek. The word of God is what saves us. Scripture cleanses us from the lies that we have believed and replaces them with the truth, with the truth. What did Jesus say about himself? I am the truth, whose life now flows through, a, through the branch. It's the life of the vine that flows through the branch. The truth, Jesus, flows through us. In John 17, verse 17, um, we read this, this is Jesus' high priestly prayer. Again, in the context of all of this, because this is all flows, it's all the same teaching that Jesus is giving here. Jesus is praying to his Father, and he says to him, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. This is what cleanses us. The word of God is what saves us and cleans us to begin with. It's what cleanses us as we walk with the Lord by faith, as we trust him and believe him. In John 18, 37, uh, Jesus uh, says this. Okay, he's speaking with, with Pilate here. And uh, Pilate said to him, Are you a king then? And Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Every branch that is in the vine that bears fruit is a branch that hears the word of God. Hears the truth, and the truth resonates with them because the life of Christ is in them. The truth is in Jesus. Let me read a, another passage of Scripture to you. I just, again, to emphasize this as much as I can. Listen to Paul's words in Ephesians chapter 4. There, he, this I say, therefore, testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Do you want to know the truth? The truth is in Jesus. Do you want to know the truth? Jesus says, your word is truth. There is no truth without Jesus. There is no truth without the word of God. You will not find it. The truth is in Jesus. Back to the parable. Abide in me, verse 4, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Abide in me. In me, he says. What does he mean when he says abide or abiding? I think obviously that Jesus is exhorting them to continue in him. That is to continue in faith, to continue in love, to continue in obedience. He's saying to them, don't be a fruitless branch. Just as a branch abides 
in the vine and the life of the vine abides in the branch because you are to abide in me. Now, I want you to come with me and let's look at this carefully, all right? To understand exactly what he's saying. He's saying a branch cannot bear fruit unless it abides in the vine. Well, that's pretty clear, right? I mean, any of you, even if, even if you're, you've never worked on a vine, even if you've never been in a garden, you know that if a branch is cut off from a tree or a vine, what's going to happen to it? It's going to die. We all know that. It doesn't bear fruit, does it? It cannot bear fruit. It can't do it on its own. Next, they are branches, these 11 that he's speaking to, and those who are like them in their faith. They are branches that bear fruit, for they have been cleansed, pruned by the Father. You are already clean. So they are saved by the grace and mercy of God. So currently, they abide in Jesus, for they are branches that bear fruit. That's what he likens them to. And this is the only way that we can bear fruit if we abide in the vine. We can only bear fruit if we are first of all saved by the grace of God, saved because of faith in Jesus Christ. Abide then is being saved, entering into a personal relationship with Jesus through faith in Jesus, through faith in the work that Jesus has done that Jesus has accomplished through his life, not my own. On my own, I'm a branch cut off. I'm a branch that's just going to die and could never bear fruit on its own. I must be connected to the vine. I must be connected to Jesus. I must have his life in me. I must be saved by the grace and mercy of God because a branch on its own is dead. Abide means being saved, having a personal relationship with Jesus. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 14 says, For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. That speaks of abiding. We have become partakers, and we are partakers if we're holding our confidence steadfast to the end. Romans 1, 17 says, For it is... Speaking of the gospel, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. If you're living by faith in Jesus, you are a branch in the vine that is bearing fruit. You have the life of Christ in you. Verse Peter, chapter 1, verse 5, who are kept. We've been begotten again, he says, in the context of that that verse, uh, 1 Peter 1, 5, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fades not away, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. God keeps us. What's the means by which God keeps us? Faith is the means by which God keeps us. It is not an ordinary faith. It's not a common faith. It is a saving faith. It is a gift from God. And it is a faith through which, the means of which God keeps us. If you don't have that faith, you're not kept. But that faith guarantees you'll be kept. And you will persevere to the end. You won't give up somewhere along the way. In uh, John chapter 6, verse 37, Jesus speaks these very comforting words. All that the Father gives me, same as the branches that are in the, in the vine, that are bearing fruit, all the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. Once we are cleansed in salvation... We are kept in salvation by the power of God and the faith that he has given us. 
You cannot lose your salvation. You cannot somehow be cut off from the vine. You will be connected. You will abide in the vine. But, he says, you will continue to abide. That is, the faith that you had to enter into the vine will continue to keep you in the vine. Because it is a faith that is a gift from God. It's a supernatural faith. Amen. It's a faith you can't muster up on your own. Amen. It's a work that God does in you to draw you to Jesus. To draw you in. To pull you in. To bring the bride in to the, to the Savior, the groom. As we talked about in a previous message. So Jesus says here, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides the, in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. So the vine, the branch must be connected or will never produce fruit. We are dead branches and we are without fruit if we do not abide in Christ. That is, unless we are saved by faith in Christ, unless we have that cleansing, that washing of salvation by faith in Christ, a faith that saves and a faith that perseveres, who are kept by the power of God through faith. The faith that saves is also a faith that obeys Christ. It all goes together. It all works together. Now we've mentioned as we've gone through this, that what separates these branches, there are branches that are cut off because they never bear fruit, because they only suck the life of the vine into themselves and never use it to produce fruit for, for, uh, the, uh, for the vine. And the, the Father cuts them off. They are false branches. And so what separates the two is fruit. That Jesus is referring to here and the true branches bear the fruit, the, the false branches do not bear the fruit. So what is the fruit? I asked that question at the end of last week's message, told you to have to wait till this week. Didn't want to give it to you too soon, so you'd hang on and, and listen through the whole message. So what is this fruit? Well, let's, first of all, let's define it from this parable. The fruit is produced in us the same way fruit is produced in a vine. All right? Fruit is produced in us the same way that fruit is produced in a vine. That's the illustration he's using. Next, the fruit is produced on the branch. It is produced on all the branches who abide in the vine. All the branches that abide on the vine bear fruit. All of them. There are no exceptions. If you don't bear fruit, you're not abiding. You're not saved. Next, the fruit is the result of the life of the vine flowing through the branch. It is produced by the life of Christ flowing through us. It's not produced by us. It's produced by Christ and his life in us because we cannot produce this fruit on our own. We cannot bear fruit in ourselves. We can't do it. We're dead branches without Christ, without the vine. It is only as we abide in Christ, as we are saved through faith in Christ, and so living by faith in him, that fruit is produced in us. Those who abide in Christ come under the loving, chastening, the pruning of the Father, the vine dresser. And so he has uh, cut off the flesh and he continues to do that in our lives. And these branches continue to bear fruit through the Father's work. And part of the Father's work is that pruning. He, he, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7, if you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom the Father does not chasten? The chastening that God accomplishes in us it's a continuous chastening because he loves us, because we are, we are his and he deals with us as with sons. And then verse 11 of Hebrews 12, now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, 
but painful. Nevertheless, afterwards it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Who are those who have been tra trained by it? Those who abide in the vine. Those who are, are connected to the vine and are not cut off. Those are the ones who have been trained by it. So these are, the, this is the fruit. I want you to compare this with other scriptures. And I, in your notes, you'll see that I've got seven displays of, of fruit here that uh, I want to look at. Seven displays of fruit. What is this fruit? Well, first of all, from Galatians 5, 22 and 23, it is spirit-produced fruit. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. That's fruit that's in our life. This is spirit-produced fruit, a fruit that we couldn't produce ourselves. Secondly, he speaks of the fruit of our lips, the fruit of our lips being praise and thanks from Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. We're not going to look up all these, and we're not going to have all these up here. Uh, they're in your notes, and you can look them up later. The fruit of our lips. So what comes out of our lips now? Praise and thanks. That's, that's part of the fruit of the life of Christ in us. Uh, thirdly, sacrificial giving to the Lord. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18, the church has just given a great, uh, uh, bountiful gift to Paul. And he's, he's thanking them for this gift. But he's saying, I, I, it's, it's not that, that, that I sp spoke in regard to want, and it's not because I'm, I'm just thankful that you relieve my uh, my needs. What I'm really thankful for is the fruit that is going to abound to your account because of your generous giving. In Matthew 3, 8, it speaks of the fruit, it speaks of fruits worthy of repentance. Fruits worthy of repentance. So the fruit of repentance shows up in our life. Number five, Fruits of righteousness from Philippians 1, 11. Fruits of righteousness. And in Hebrews 12, 11, it speaks of the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Righteousness brings peace. That's why there's so much turmoil in the world. That's why there's no peace. There's no righteousness. Righteousness brings peace. Amen. Number six. It speaks of them being fruitful in every good work. Colossians 1, 10 fruitful in every good work. So the good works we do through the life of Christ in us uh, is part of that fruitfulness, the fruitfulness that is, that is seen by others. And then number seven, uh, Romans 1, 13, Paul speaks of, of wanting to, to come and be with them that he might have fruit among you. That is converts. He's speaking there of converts, people who are one to Christ, people who are saved because of the ministry of the Apostle Paul. So, fruit is what the life of Christ produces in us. It produces trust in the Lord and in his word, not in ourselves. It produces gratitude, a giving of thanks. Thanks always for all things. It produces humility before God and others. It produces perseverance. We may doubt at times, but we don't desert Christ. And it produces, produces praise to God in everything. Fruit is not earthly success. Fruit is not a big ministry. Fruit is not praise of men. Fruit is not religious activity. The simplest understanding of fruit is this. Fruit is everything the life of Christ produces in and through us. That's what fruit is. That's what it is in this parable. It is what the life of Christ produces in us and through us. And so that would include every attitude, every thought, every motive, every desire, every deed, and every eternal result is fruit that Jesus is producing in us. Everything the life of Christ is accomplishing. So some questions as we come to a close. Does the fruit of our lives indicate the presence of Christ in us?
Can we see Christ in us producing fruit that we know would be impossible for us to produce ourselves? Next question. Do we experience the chastening, that is the pruning of God in us? That is, cutting off the deeds and the desires of our flesh and producing the deeds and desires of Christ. If you can say yes, then you abide in Christ. You are saved through faith in him. He has made you a fruitful branch that lives by faith in him and has no confidence in the flesh. Religion and religious deeds will never be enough. Just coming to church is not enough. Just giving is not enough. There must be the life of Christ in us. Even words are not enough. Jesus, Jesus spoke about the generation he was in, that they honored him with their words and lips, but their heart was far from them, from him. So words are not enough. Not even a prayer is enough because it's not about what I have said or what I have done. It is about faith in Christ and what he has done. Faith in his life flowing through us. It is about bearing fruit through the life of Christ in us. Do you believe that Jesus alone can forgive your sins? because he died on the cross to pay the price for your sins. Do you believe that? Do you believe that he alone can give you eternal life? He proved he could do it. He rose from the dead. He proved that death couldn't hold him. He has the power to give you eternal life, and he alone has the power to give you eternal life. He said of himself, I am the life. And do you trust him? Him alone to bring you into a right relationship with God. Connected to Jesus. Entering into a personal relationship with him as the branch is in a personal relationship with the vine. An intimate relationship. It is through that kind of faith that we become a branch that abides in Christ the vine. Cleansed, washed from our sin. And have his life now flowing through us to produce eternal fruit that blesses us, blesses others, and honors God. That is the fruitful branch that abides in the vine. Is that you? Is that you? If not, you need Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this parable we thank you for the message of this parable, the message of salvation in Christ. We thank you, Father, for the work that you do in drawing people to Jesus Christ. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who works through the word of God to convict of sin and to open eyes to see the beauty of Jesus, that he is Savior and Lord, that he forgives sins, that he alone can bring us into a right relationship with Jesus Christ. So as ones who abide in the vine, may we be bringing forth more and more fruit. May we see the pruning of the Father as an act of love toward us and as a necessary work to bring forth more fruit, to cut off the things that would hinder the fruit. And Father, I pray for any here without Christ, not in the vine. The life of Christ is not in them. Open their eyes to see that Jesus came to save sinners. He came to redeem those who are lost. Convict them of their lost condition and that Jesus can save them from it. Convict them of what their sin is doing and what Jesus can do in delivering them from their sin and bring them to faith in Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.